Hi everybody. I, I think we're all here. So if it's all right with you, um, we'll kick off. Uh, my name is Ben Mawson. I'm uh, studying for a PhD in the Department of Music. And um, I'm going to explain to you the, the, the background, the origins of an idea which I've been doggedly pursuing for a couple of years. Um, and then I'm going to move on to introduce you to um, some colleagues that I'm working with using the project. Um, so first of all, it's, uh, it's called Threadbare. Um, well, that's how we pronounce it. And I'm going to run you through. The first thing I'm going to do is show you a fairly lengthy quote, but I promise, promise it will be the only one of its kind. So Threadbare is a machine for walking inside sound. And I'm, I'm just going to read you this, and I, I want to ask you if you can tell me when you think that this was written. Today, with the technical means that exist and are easily adaptable, the differentiation of masses and planes as beams of sound could be made discernible to the listener by means of certain acoustical arrangements, which would permit the delim delimitation of what I call zones of intensities, differentiated by various timbres, colours, loudnesses, and these would become agents of delineation like the different colours on a map, separating different areas and an integral part of form. These zones would be felt as isolated, and the hitherto unobtainable non-blending, or at least the sensation of non-blending, would become possible. Anybody want to hazard a guess when those words were written? 1925? Oh, cool, I like it. Uh, <laughs> any other guesses? <laughs> well, this is uh, one of my heroes, Edgar Varese, writing in 1936 about something that could then only be imagined, of course by a visionary like him. So this is what we're trying to do. I'm going to talk to you quickly about what Threadbed does. It basically allows you to move as though inside a physical object constructed of sound. Um, and then I'm going to talk about why we might do this, because it's an idea that a lot of people think, uh, well, they haven't heard of before and they wonder why you would bother. Um, and I'm going to try to explain the rationale for this. Um, and then my colleague Iad is going to explain He's working on the technical implementation of a lot of these things, so he's going to talk about how that's being done. Um, and then we're going to talk about the multidisciplinary project that we're currently involved in using Threadbare. So, a quick look at some of the reasons. If you compose complex music in the digital studio, you can do things that can't be done with acoustical instruments. Um, you can simulate reality, or you can simulate the plausible, which is in fact impossible. When you want to listen to this music on loudspeakers, you're basically back in a situation where you're listening to a CD on uh, a system that can't possibly render reality to you. It's tangibly artificial and very limited in what it can convey. It's also very expensive. I did sound effects for a, uh, a play in which I prepared everything in the studio with some speakers, some headphones, and I went to the theatre and it was a horseshoe shape made of wood. So it was a very small space, perhaps taking 60 people in the audience, but very resonant. And I had to do things quickly to the sound on the day of the performance in order to make it OK. We shifted it then to an enormous concrete auditorium, and I had to put everything back and do some other things. So working with speakers is fundamentally problematic, unpredictable, and of course it doesn't really simulate the reality that we're working so hard to do. So footsteps in the snow across the stage, you could tell it was coming through speakers. Imagine if everybody had been listening to wireless headsets and they'd actually heard this thing ominously approaching across their field. So the wireless headset, brilliant for realism, and of course the advantage is that you don't have to carry around speakers on your shoulders. You simply walk in the space, and we're going to talk about how we project sound to you doing that. Let's look at a couple of current models quickly. We go to an orchestra concert. Four listeners in the auditorium. There's the Berlin Philharmonic. And we've got four people sitting all around the orchestra. And this is quite a modern configuration, of course. Most people would be traditionally in a block, facing a block of instrumentalists. Let's call them A, B, C, and D, and look at how A and B listen. A is sitting way back here, and for the duration of the concert, whatever they're listening to, the violins are on their left, the bass is on their right, and somewhere at the back of that field of sound is the uh, wind and percussion. B here's something fundamentally different, again, fixed, it, impossible to explore. So let's look at what happens at an acousmatic concert. We have a series of seats arranged, again, looks a bit odd, it's a fisheye lens, I think. 
and we've got four speakers there, more out of view. Now, the speakers are fixed, just like the violins and the oboes in the orchestra, but at least we can now send sound swirling around the audience. But the problem is that you're still in fixed relation to those sounds, so we still have, albeit something that might be using space as a layer in the music, fundamentally a fixed object, which you're presented with as though it were a physical thing, which of course it isn't. Um, let's talk about what acousmatic music means, because I've jumped in there with that term and I want to try and explain it. Music from unseen sources. That's St. Mark's in Venice. So 400 years ago, people were spreading choirs out through the church and having them singing from different areas of the cathedral, from unseen points, creating a sense of awe and wonder. And this was inspired, of course, by Willard, who'd started working 150 years earlier on some of the same methods. Here we've got a couple of examples of uses of trumpets and drums off stage to create dramatic effects throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. And here we've got Pierre Schaeffer, the um, French composer who arguably was the first to use samples 60 years ago, creating a piece called Symphonie pour Nom Seul, which is a selection of found objects and fragments cobbled together. You can see here this extraordinary equipment that's necessary. These are record turntables. So to create a piece made of samples, you couldn't actually splice it together. You had to decide what all your fragments were, carry all your records and all your turntables and speakers up there, and you had to conduct people at turntables, like, play that fragment now, that bit. And there was no way of mastering this. So every time it was performed, it was kind of live. It was kind of a bit like taking a score of a string quartet and performing it. It would be hard to predict. So it took years until tape was manageable before this could be done. Now, why am I looking at this? Well, we've got this extraordinary way of thinking about sound, and yet we've replaced the orchestra with some engineers at the front and some, or in the middle, this sort of boxing ring arrangement. But in all other respects, it's a basically like a symphony orchestra concert. We've got an orchestra in the middle and an audience around them. So this term, acousmatic, the acousmaticoi were Pythagoras' followers. And he, uh, it's repeated that he looked very odd and he didn't want people to really pay much attention to that while he was talking. So he spoke from behind a veil. And his followers, the acousmaticoi, gave Schaefer the idea to use this term in music, which for him marks the perceptive reality of sound as such, as distinguished from the modes of its production and transmission. We're moving towards that. Of course, if you're watching people at turntables, you're still distracted by their action, I suppose. The sound is still mediated. But what he's talking about is the idea that we could perceive just the sound. Uh, and this is exciting for me working in the digital studio because all the respect in the world to orchestral musicians, it's simpler to work with sound as a finished object than to work with a half-imagined idea transcribed, taken to somebody and you discuss the meaning of the document and then the translation of the document into sound. It's a process I still like being involved in, but it's got its own complications. And what Schaefer is talking about here is just the sound. The first time ever these things are possible. So I might glance over that, but I'll just say from the beginning... And an opera for blind people, a performance without argument, a poem made of noises, bursts of texts, spoken or musical. He's admitting to his musical language sounds which were not possible to admit to the classical canon. And he's expanding the notion of what might be a musical composition. But still, like Varese, only able really to imagine what this might be like. This is stunning to me. This is a couple of years ago, a, a church in Berlin, already for a concert using speakers. The reason it's stunning is that it might as well be St. Mark's Venice in the 17th century. We have all of these notions about how music might be torn apart and reconstituted logically and expressively, and yet we're still sitting in a block of seats, listening to sound from fixed sources, and most importantly, I think for me, uh, as a composer rather than as somebody working in sound generally, this idea that a composition is still an object, a fixed thing, like a sculpture. Of course it isn't. It's a series of intangible things, half-imagined, 
half delivered to the to the recipient. Um, it, it's a constant sort of struggle with the unknowable. So that this setting, just like watching the Berlin Philharmonic, we're we're treating the audience to the to the deception that they're being given a thing, and I want to try and see whether we can transcend that. So. Why bother sitting down? Why even do it in a building? Here's a fun experiment. Again, like 45 years old. This is a cave in Lebanon. And these people are listening to a piece by Stockhausen. I thought I'd get you a, a better picture of the cave. It's a remarkable spot to hear a performance. This is something I tried to do a couple of years ago. Um, this is a, a rough draft, one of many, floor plan of the art gallery on campus. Speakers, live players wondering how we'd work with the occlusions in the space, and what would happen if we asked people to move around while things happened over time at lots of different points, and you experienced something as you moved around, of course, a single set of uh, sounds over a sequence. Um, one of the interesting challenges of this was that the artist kept changing which walls he wanted internally, so we didn't know what the occlusions were going to be, and it turned out to be different from this in the end. I, I should have made this apology at the beginning. You're not going to hear any sound, but I hope that the content of what I'm telling you explains why. So this is a piece I, I wrote that got played on this row of 12 speakers in the window of the, the foyer of Queen Elizabeth Hall. Um, now you've got 12 pianos doing something very complex in their combination. It's going to be impossible to hear what's really going on. This is a little screen capture, a moment from the piece. If you were able to hear this on its own, or coupled with that, or that coupled with that, and next time you revisited this moment to listen to what this combination did, you might be able to explore the contents of the piece um, and understand something of the perspective I was coming from in trying to combine these sounds. As it is, you hear everything together, and it's not really very easy to understand what's going on at all, particularly when they're in a row like this. Very interesting. Uh, problematic because of course you don't know until you get somewhere how it's going to be relayed for you. So here's a proposal. We spread the 12 pianos out across a space and we only make each piano audible within a given circle. So the top left piano in the green circle is only audible within that circumference, the yellow within that. So you can make them converge and I'm going to show you what might happen if you walked around the space listening. This tries to describe what you might hear over time. A second listener takes a different route and they hear a different sequence of the piece. This can be repeated ad infinitum and of course allows for infinite permutations of the combinations of sound that we've heard. So how are we doing it? Well, we're going to relay sound to a, a wireless headset, virtually spatialized. It seems like things were over there, there, and there. And when you move around, we track you, and we inversely correlate the sound to put them back where they were, so that they, they seem to remain at the spot they were in the space. It's quite tricky to do. Here's a, a quick representation of what that might mean. Let's say you've got a quartet. You rotate your head. When you're listening to an MP3 player, you rotate your head, the band follows you. It's a bit like having an enormous cage filled with musicians as you walk around. It's not very realistic. In this setting, we inversely correlate the position of the sound to your movement, and you turn to the right, and the sounds remain where they were by having rotated to the left. So this is where we've got to so far. After much struggle, we've got uh, limitless audio sources possible at last. We can measure the, your vector in space um, in order to calibrate the distance of sounds from you, and we can respond to your angle of rotation. What we're looking to do now is full wireless tracking, because at the moment we're doing it on a screen. Other operating systems for implementation. Sorry, just there, did you want to sit down or shall I leave it? Not for now, thanks. No, that's great. Um, and then we want to put it on gaming platforms. So the great thing about that will be that we can integrate surround sound with your action on a screen, for example, um, and do things that the gaming environment can't currently do, and perhaps use the gaming environment for other applications as well with this more realistic sound. Then the room impulse response. That's the real, uh, that's the real poser. 
In, you know the size and shape of this room, even if you shut your eyes. And if you, if you listen to me over here, I've now, the source of my sound is now coming to you from this side of the room. And you can also tell which way I'm facing because of the resonances in the space. If I, if I talk to you like that, it changes the sound of the voice because it's reflecting off the, off the wall. And equally, if I do that or that, or if I lie on the floor, you can tell where my sound's coming from by what your ears and your brain are doing to work that out. And you're also working out what type of a space we're in. <coughs> Simulating that is a challenge, and we're working on it. Very quickly, <coughs> build a piece of music. It runs from left to right over time. These are 51 tracks of a choral piece. The yellow line there indicates a single part, and we're going to put that in a particular spot. Each of those blue sounds, blue spots is a sound. The listener at the centre of this spider web is able, as they move around the space, to only hear those things to which they're connected by a red line. And that's the ultimate effect, that they seem actually to be walking through the musical score. So two listeners can navigate through a physical space a different experience of the piece on each occasion. I'm not going to tell you any more now. That's hopefully painted a picture of what the tool is, why I want to do it, um, and I'm going to pass you over to Iad, who's working on the technical implementation, and then to Professor Tim Elliott and Dr. Godfrey Brandt, with whom we're working on a very exciting collaboration using this toy in the real world to explore some non-musical facts. Some other ideas very quickly. Heritage and tourism. Um, we've been approached by uh, certain parties who want to know how they could profit from allowing people to walk inside sound without having to press buttons to say, I am here, I am here. Um, immersive theatre, the possibility for using space as well as time uh, to convey a story which might have many possible strands of development. Um, so working at the moment with uh, those first two projects are things that use GPS location, in fact, but they're a way of exploring, again, how... Movement through space allows a negotiable uh, experience of sound over time. And the last project is one that my colleagues are going to tell you all about in full now. So, thank you for listening. Okay. Hello. You've broken it. I have, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll just sit down again. Okay, so I'm going to give you a brief overview on how I've been uh, implementing this in the technical side of everything. So the binaural audio development, uh, I'm not sure if any of you guys know, but binaural is basically the study of both ears and how they relate and how you, how you can change with the ears with audio, basically. I'll explain that better. Uh, the listener tracking, we've been working with stuff like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth tracking, and then GPS and open CV, that sort of thing. Um, so Ben already talked about what Threadbare actually does. Uh, basically, the idea is you know you're walking around uh, just like you in this room, and you, you know you hear something at the back. So you, you know, obviously you can hear that it's that way. So when you turn around, it will render in the ears, in, in the headphones. So it will seem like you've actually turned towards it, as opposed to you know wearing earphones and hearing the band turn around in your head. Okay. Uh, then we've got the idea that Ben talked about when he shouted at the wall quite aggressively uh, about uh, simulating the uh, room, in the, simulating the actual room, so you can you can walk in, you can walk around, and in the next step you can feel like you're in a church. You hear massive amounts of reverb, and then step backwards, walk around a little bit more, and you feel like you're in a box. That sort of uh, augmented reality type aspect. Uh, and what we're, what we want to do is to have multiple listeners, so you know lots and lots of people can actually be walking around. The, uh, the, the the music and uh, experiencing it different ways, uh, and then we're trying to make it as low cost as possible, really, because uh, I mean we don't really want to be spending like you know, I, I got a quote from a tracking company for a hundred grand for <laughs> for a um, you know a motion picture type tracking thing, but we're trying to make it as cheap as possible. Um, so the three main challenges are the listener tracking. Uh, how we're actually going to figure out where you are in a room. Uh, 
and then we've got the user interface, which also, you know, the, we have something that the composer can actually choose where in the room, like a violin would be. So you can choose over there, there'd be a violin. At the back, there'd be a bassoon. And so you can c kind of relate the tracking to the to the, actually where the things are. And then the last step is the actual engine, the actual audio engine that, that renders the audio in real time as you're walking around. Okay, so, so far we've got uh, two binaural audio rendering engines made by uh, a, a guy called Miguel and a guy called uh, Tudor in ISVR uh, that we're looking at. And uh, yeah, we'll, we've been uh, kind of controlling them using various things to try and get out. Um, we've got the user interface that I talked about, the Ben showed you, it was the, the, the blue dots with the kind of spiders web type thing. Uh, but that, that's how you basically control where everything is. Uh, and what we're trying to work out now is the different types of tracking. Um, yeah, I mean, like uh, we've been looking at proximity of uh, like Bluetooth beacons or Wi-Fi beacons, and then there's like uh, you know infrared tracking and camera tracking, which all have their own issues. Um, the implementation. So if we were able to shrink this down to something like an Android device or an iOS device, uh, the, you know that would be uh, much much easier instead of having to have one host computer and then beam out the signals into several wireless headsets, uh, which we are trying to do currently. Um, lastly, the Raspberry Pi, I, I tried it out because I thought it would be a nice idea to have everything self-contained in a headset. So you have like a small computer on the side and you don't need to carry around like a phone and everything. Um, okay, so obviously computer vision, cameras tracking, uh, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth tracking, and also we have an outdoor option with a well-tested GPS. Okay, and that's the interface I just showed you. Um, so you can place the sources wherever you like, choose, you, if you look in the little red box, you can choose which source you want, uh, which audio file it corresponds to, and which volume. Uh, and as you see the little, uh, the little black arrow, I'm not sure if you can see in the middle, is the actual listener. And as you move away and closer, it will get louder. And also your orientation renders where you actually hear the sound. Okay, uh, the binaural audio processing. Um, the ISVR people, uh, Miguel, uh, made some calculations using a dummy head, which you can see in the corner. Uh, you basically put um, little microphones in the ears and you record a sound, the same sound, 360 degrees around it. Uh, and then you cr uh, calculate how to make filters out of that. So basically, when you run the audio through it, it figures out which <laughs> ear it should be going into more and it kind of tries to uh, what's the word uh, tries to make it sound like you would be you know in real time uh, at the moment we've only got two degrees of freedom so just left and right uh, we're hoping to have you know up and down so you can hear something on the floor hear something on the ceiling you know if you turn that way it'll be louder that way as opposed to this way um, and that sort of thing uh, and as I said um, at the moment we've got like a host computer beaming out to several wireless headsets uh, and the Raspberry Pi and iOS Android kind of thing. Okay, and the the current work that we're kind of looking at also is, uh, you know, real time virtualization and streaming of live performance. So if we actually had a real ensemble playing all mic'd up, several instruments all mic'd up separately, you could actually have a live performance, but removed from where the live performance actually is. So if you have like, you know, you could actually choose where the violins, where the, where the cellos, where everything would be separately, as opposed to having to just look at it straight ahead and actually still have a live performance, as opposed to a recorded or uh, you know computer-generated one. Uh, use that triggered activation of audio, pretty self-explanatory. So if you walk in an area, and then you know you, you walk in a certain spot, you'll hear a cello over there, you hear whatever. Um, gives it a bit more of a virtual reality type feel. Uh, We've been talking with uh, Scream Lab in Taiwan about uh, physical modeling uh, instruments. Um, and then we've got the uh, virtual occlusion, so things like if, you're, if there's a wall here and a violin on the other side, you'd hear that it's you know, clearly it's on the other side of a wall. Uh, six degrees of freedom, and then augmented, augmented reality, so we can kind of change properties of sound. So if you turn this way, suddenly the sound that you've been hearing over there is very distorted, and if you move back, it's not so much. And, you know, all sorts of augmented reality goodies. Okay, so that's my part. Thank you very much.
Yeah, good morning. So uh, I'm uh, Tim Elliott. I'm an immunologist, and you might ask yourself uh, what on earth uh, I'm doing here. <coughs> I would say I've asked myself the same question, uh, and hopefully during the course of the next 20 minutes or so, uh, it'll become obvious uh, not only to you, but to me too. Um, so I'm um, interested in our natural defense against virus and against cancer. Okay, And I'm going to take you into my... Uh, my core discipline uh, in a minute. Um, but I should say that the starting point for, uh, for my involvement here was a conversation that I had with uh, Ben quite recently. I was introduced by uh, Godfrey. And immediately I could see a way of uh, using this technology to illustrate a very complex biological phenomenon that so far hasn't yet uh, been illustrated. We can, I can describe it and I'll, I'll describe it for you. But it hasn't really been illustrated um, very effectively uh, to date. And the more that we talked, um, the more I realized that we could not only use this as a, as a tool for illustrating uh, a complex biological phenomenon, but we might also be able to make something of real cultural and artistic value. And that's something that uh, we're probably going to only just touch on in the next half an hour, but uh, hopefully you'll be able to see uh, some of the potential um, for mixing our two disciplines. So if you could uh, just put up my uh, first slide there. Just trying to get it up, sorry. Okay. <laughs> so, well, I, I, I'll start. I mean, I'm interested in the way that our immune system, particularly our white blood cells, a particular kind of blood cell called the cytotoxic T lymphocytes, detects and eradicates virus-infected cells within our body. So. We've got billions and billions of these uh, cytotoxic T cells, and they're uh, moving around our body uh, all the time, surveying um, uh, all, the t all tissues in our bodies. And when they notice that one of those, uh, a cell within one of those tissues has been infected with a, a virus, potentially dangerous virus, it will recognize that fact, and it will kill it, thereby preventing the uh, dissemination of viral infection throughout the body. So this is um, actually, um, if you go into uh, this person's nose, uh, magnify it about a million times. This is uh, a nasal epithelial cell here in orange. This is a real electron micrograph, so this is real life. Uh, and this is a swarm of these uh, white blood cells called cytotoxic T cells. I'll call them CTL uh, from now on. Recognizing this virus-infected cell um, um, by this interface, through this interface here. And the upshot of this recognition event is that they'll squirt out a lot of toxins. They'll uh, destroy the cell. Uh, and they'll, uh, when that uh, when that cell's destroyed, so the means for propagating uh, a virus is also destroyed. It's like a, a virus factory. Uh, once a, a cell's been in, uh, infected, that's all all that happens in the side of that cell. It just makes more and more viruses, and uh, um, uh, which spread to uh, neighbouring cells. Okay, so that's uh, uh, that's what I'm interested in. How it happens. So. Key to this whole uh, biological phenomenon is precisely how those CTL recognize a virus infected cell. I mean, how does it happen? Well, it happens at the molecular level. Um, so, if we um, uh, zoom in again about a million fold, um, looking at this interface here between this uh, cytotoxic T cell and a virus infected cell here, zoom in about a million fold, and what you see are molecules. And these molecules uh, coat. Uh, the, um, all the, the surface of all our cells, they're called MHC molecules, and uh, what they do is present short fragments of all proteins that are turning over inside uh, our cells at the cell surface. surface. So these are uh, called peptides. They're strings of nine amino acids. These are a basic building block of, uh, of all proteins. Uh, and they're uh, bound to these MHC molecules. They're held up at the, at the cell surface. Um, now, there are about a billion different kinds of peptides that can be made by nature, okay? And that's because there are 20 different amino acids, uh, and um, they're all nine amino acids long. So that's 20 to the power of nine uh, different possibilities. So it's quite a task, um, first of all, to sort of conceive this level of complexity at the cell surface. Um, but also to uh, try and uh, uh, illustrate how a cytotoxic T cell can figure out which one of these uh, uh, peptides comes from a virus and therefore is dangerous and you must recognize it, activate and kill, and which of those just come from you know, any old protein, an insulin molecule or something that, you know, that's good uh, inside your body. 
Um, and that's where this, uh, um, this whole um, idea of, um, of, of illustrating um, recognition using a you know, different medium, we're kind of uh, um, uh, shackled to visual representations of this phenomena in, in my field. Uh, and uh, it occurred to me after talking to Ben that actually we could use a whole new sensorial system. You know, instead of uh, writing out these uh, peptide sequences in using letters or different colours, what if we could listen to them? If those were, instead of uh, uh, 20 different uh, amino acids, if they were 20 different notes. Uh, and so every MHC molecule that I've just shown you here would sort of sing uh, this, um, this sequence uh, rather than, you know, have it... Uh, just there as, uh, as uh, a string of, uh, of letters, um, and it would sing it over and over again. So each MHC molecule at the cell surface would sing a, a repetitious uh, um, uh, tune of um, nine notes. Okay? Now, one interesting feature um, that I, uh, I ought to mention of um, uh, peptides that bind to MHC molecules is they, they share two so-called anchor residues. That's how they, that's how they inter interact with the MHC molecule. So you'd hear the sequence of uh, nine notes punctuated um, 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 every second and ninth note by a common, uh, a common sound. Okay. So let me just try and illustrate the complexity of that, uh, that situation. So this is now our cell. This is, this is a painting, by the way. It's, uh, um, it's not a, a photograph anymore. This is now our cell. You can see it's coated with these uh, MHC molecules. If you blow up this one here, you've got the MHC molecule here with a presenting a peptide. Every one of those MHC molecules can, uh, can present a different uh, sequence uh, in theory. Okay. Um, so any one of a billion uh, different peptides, it's holding up a single one. And each peptide um, has a, the same general sound of you know, anything, specific uh, note, anything, 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 da da da, to the uh, last one, the ninth one, and there's a specific note. So you could imagine what that cell sounds like now. I mean, I, unfortunately, we haven't put it together, so I don't know precisely what it sounds like, but it, it, uh, Ben assures me it would sound ugly. Uh, it's basically a cacophonous sound punctuated every so often with a single note, okay? Um, so every MHC molecule is kind of singing a different, uh, a different song. Uh, this one's uh, singing this uh, repeat, this one's singing a different repeat, and so on, and so on, and so on. So that's, that's what we sound like, okay? Now, what happens with an infection? So here, here comes a virus, um, attaches to that cell, and uh, infects it. And what happens when it infects it is that it adds its own genome now to that, uh, all those sequences. So this, there, there are some new peptides in there. They're treated in exactly the same way. The virus is, uh, is chewed up inside the cell, and these peptides derived from the virus are loaded onto MHC molecules and put out to the cell surface. So sonically, uh, that might be uh, that um, uh, sequentially MHC molecule after MHC molecule now switches over from singing its own song uh, to, its original song rather, to one that's been delivered to it by the viral protein. Okay, and you can imagine how this, uh, this sequence would then uh, propagates as more and more uh, MHC molecules got uh, loaded up with peptides derived from the virus. Um, so an interesting question um, is, you know, at, at what point does that cacophony of sound start to resolve into something that's discernible as a single, uh, a, you know, a single song, as a single uh, uh, sequence of um, uh, um, uh, peptides? What proportional uh, representation of MHC molecules uh, presenting viral peptides uh, is required for, you know, for you to uh, discern the difference between you know, the, the, the white noise, 10,000 different uh, uh, sounds all overlaid, um, and now the appearance of this, uh, this unique song. And that's a, that, you know, that's a difficult phenomenon to, uh, to illustrate. As, as I say, it hadn't, hasn't been done, uh, and I don't know the answer, but I think that um, we'll see something very uh, exciting when we actually you know, run the, the experiment. You might see, for example, you might be able to perceive uh, a... Um, a reducing of the complexity of the sound in the first instance without actually being able to determine any you know, single, uh, uh, single song. And then the song will uh, kind of emerge, as, as, as Ben said, a bit like tuning in uh, a radio from, uh, um, from you know, white noise to, uh, to the signal band. Okay, so that's, um, 
that's this sort of presentation of, uh, of this kind of complexity. What about the other side? So that's, you know, that's, that's what our bodies might, uh, might sound like uh, after a viral infection. Um, how do the cytotoxic T cells, how do the CTL sort of hear uh, this difference? Well, uh, going back to biology now, the, kind of the, the ears of a CTL are these uh, protein receptors that are expressed on the surface of all cytotoxic T cells. And they're tuned to recognize just one peptide sequence out of many. I mean, the, the immunology behind this is absolutely fascinating. The fact is that each individual uh, CTL in your body is actually programmed to recognize a particular sequence, so billions and billions of different uh, possibilities. Um, you just have to take my word for that. And, uh, uh, the actual the evolution of that system is absolutely fascinating. Uh, but it does it by uh, a, a, a process of uh, matching complementary surfaces. So the kind of the ears on the, on the cytotoxic T cell um, uh, are complementary to uh, a particular peptide presented by an MHC molecule. So um, one kind of literal analogy of that might be if uh, each CTL uh, in our body it's kind of programmed to you know, sing a complementary song. It might sing the same sequence uh, raised by a third or a fifth or whatever, um, so that when they're sung together, there's a nice harmony. It's pretty obvious that one is recognizing the other. Um, and once you get to that point, you think, well, this could be a really cool game. You know, you could be uh, um, you know, an individual uh, player in a game uh, in which you play the role of cytotoxic T lymphocyte, CTL. And as, you, as soon as you put yourself in this position, you start to learn something about immunological recognition. You know, whether you wanted it or not, you're now playing a game uh, and you are the CTL. And it's your job to recognize a viral sequence in a soundscape um, and to prevent the dissemination of that virus to other areas uh, of a room that may not yet have been infected. So you can see now where uh, we're, we're coming to uh, uh, sonically defined uh, uh, spaces. These are uh, just nine non-overlapping um, sort of sonic spaces, um, and exactly the same as, as the ones that Ben's just uh, uh, described, where they're overlapping. But you can imagine um, each um, uh, sonic area representing a cell singing its own version of white noise, and you as a cytotoxic T cell wandering around this, uh, this space, um, really you know, listening to uh, variations on the theme of white noise might be very boring. I think one uh, this is uh, one uh, uh, potential launch point for something much more creative. So uh, one line of discussion that uh, we uh, are having with Ben is, well, this is all well and good for illustrating a biological phenomenon, but does it have any sort of <coughs> artistic value? And uh, we think that we could actually make it a, an interesting soundscape to walk around in, and it wouldn't necessarily have to uh, sound like white noise, but, but for the purposes of illustration, uh, this is this is what it is at the moment. Um, so uh, that's that's uh, our normal uh, healthy self. So our CTL are wandering around this uh, this space, getting kind of bored. Boredom is good. It means there's no virus there. Um, now we infect one of those um, um, areas, one of those soundscapes. We infect it with a um, a virus, and just as I illustrated in uh, uh, in uh, one of the early slides, uh, that then starts to. Um, display a viral uh, sequence. It starts to sing uh, the song of, uh, of the virus uh, and our CTL is tuned to harmonize with that, so it'll wander around and at some point it'll recognize that it's singing in harmony <coughs> as this, uh, as this uh, specific song raises out of, uh, of the background of, uh, of white noise. And at that point it's recognized the cell, it's recognized infection. What happens in biology is that it destroys uh, that cell so that cell will then fall silent, and the virus is eradicated. Or is it? Because during a period of time, as our, our CTL has been wandering around uh, this space, of course our virus has been replicating, our tuners getting uh, more and more prominent above white noise, and at some point it's going to infect nearby cells. And so there's a potential then for uh, the virus to propagate into nearby cells, and the game starts all over again. And so your uh, uh, cytotoxic T lymphocyte uh, um, needs to carry on wandering around until it's absolutely sure that it's got rid of all virus. And I think that's a really cool illustration of, uh, um, of an immunological phenomenon. I think also that it, we could use it as a, uh, as a tool for learning more about um, uh, biological recognition. Uh, bio Cross-reactivity is an important phenomenon in, uh, in immunology. The reason we get autoimmune diseases is because our own T cells start to recognize 
um, are, are not infected cells. And the molecular basis for that phenomenon is uh, cross-reactivity. So how different does the tune have to be before the uh, CTL uh, recognizes or d no longer recognizes it as, a, as a, a viable harmony? All those you know, very complex um, um, ideas uh, in biology, I, th I think we can, we can use this as a sort of platform for uh, you know, driving new hypotheses. For, uh, we, we play you know, in a room like this, um, and that generates new ideas um, uh, um, about how we can look at uh, um, uh, immunological reactivity uh, in real life. I think also uh, it's a launching point for, as I said, for doing something uh, um, sort of culturally and artistically relevant, and this is uh, uh, perhaps Godfrey will uh, say a little bit more uh, about that, uh, by, you know, instead of using electronic sounds and, um, and you know, people who want to learn more about uh, uh, about biology, uh, if we bring um, you know, more people together and focus on the sound that those people are making, uh, then we have a, a sort of a ready-made uh, co community that are exploring a whole um, you know, a new way of getting together around, again, uh, a, a, a medically relevant uh, phenomenon. So I'm going to hand over to Godfrey now. I should say that this is, uh, this is the first time that we've, all four of us have got together. Um, we've had individual conversations before. This is the first time that all four of us are together, so it's a very exciting time yeah, for us all. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for that, Tim. Um, I, I, I must say that I, I find this whole process quite exciting because uh, we're making it happen as we go along, not quite. We're, there's a lot of serious research, research and, and thinking has gone into this. But uh, what I wanted to make clear, I mean, it must be clear by now, is that we, 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 you're in, in the laboratory. We are making the research right now. Uh, and a lot of this discussion that we're having, we're, ha we're having before you. Um, what, what my colleagues, I, I'll just go through my slides very quickly. There are too many and too much text. So I'm going to race along through it, and hopefully uh, you'll see with me. But at this point, can I ask you to do something? Uh, don't ask any questions, just do it. Could you stand up where you are, please? Uh, and could you raise your arms in the air like that, and bring them down slowly to one side? The next time you do it, I'd like you to intone. Any tone, just out of the <coughs> mouth, breathe in, and a tone comes out. So it's like... Oh. Oh. <laughs> I, I just think you'll be sitting for an hour <laughs> listening to people talk. You need to do something to, to, to kind of get back with it. Um, now, uh, the, the angle that I've taken on this whole question of listening for infection is the question of the space. Uh, and uh, what we try to do is to calibrate the space. Now, it's not done, but we're in the process of looking at the calibration of space. We've established that in listening for infection, one encounters a complex network of MHGs and peptides, etc., and, and you've gone into that detail. Viruses introduce aberrations that can be fixed if the immune system is, is, is functioning properly. Um, you've seen this before. But here, uh, as, as my colleague mentioned earlier, in, in this system, each cell is a, is a virtual circle with its own soundscape. The individual player uh, surveys the, 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 the soundscape, listening for complementary sequences. What, what, what uh, Tim and uh, Ben, to some extent, have largely focused on are the microstructures and processes of infection, detection, and, and transformation. What I want to explore is the part, in this part of the presentation is, if you like, the contextual. That is, the crucial issues of time and space, particularly space. This process I have described as calibrating the space. Uh, and I think as we carry on with the research, even the, the, the parameters of calibration will, 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 will emerge. But we are actually examining this. And I try to do it through a, a number of, of sources. Um, so here we have a set of, of uh, you recognize those circles there. Uh, and the important thing, there's, there's nothing else on it. What I want you to look at for the moment is the space around it. And that space, in fact, will affect what happens in there. Uh, it's what happens in life. It's what happens culturally. 
And I, I suggest that maybe we want to look at the space as well when we look at this whole question of what happens in the interaction between cells, etc. This research sets out to ask many questions. It will find some answers and create a scenario in which there's active and dynamic interaction between questions and answers, advocates and interrogators, and in a sometimes vicious, sometimes virtuous circle. Sound and silence are key factors. Other key factors are context, time and space. So what I'm trying to do is to relate cultural theory to this whole biomedical question. I was saying to my colleagues earlier, there's a, there's a very interesting dialogue which is taking place now in the research between the medical and the musical. And there, there's a, an obvious, not, 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 not maybe not obvious, but there's a clear kind of link and language which is developing in our research uh, between these two. However, tangential to that are the larger uh, cultural questions and also, believe it or not, the question of, of performance and the theatre. Uh, I, I draw on three main sources to, to, to talk about this in, in this in this presentation. One is uh, Baba, uh, who wrote a book called The Location of Culture. And Baba's interest is in culture and cultural exchange and the cultural interface. Uh, he argues that the most important thing in this whole kind of location of culture is this interface, and it's not about what and what, but what happens in, in between, in the interstices, in the, in the spaces between, in the writing, as he calls it. What he calls the third space of enunciation. According to Barber, the intervention of the third space of enunciation makes a structure of, uh, of meaning and reference an ambivalent process. All cultural statements and references are constructed in this contradictory and ambivalent space of, of, of enunciation. Uh, the point I'd like to make is about the whole notion of what I call active and passive spaces. And we have a number of illustrations. I mean, Ben's um, work or, or around th Threadbare, for example, is one example of it. You walk through uh, across the university, and I know that there are, there are areas in, on, on the grounds here which are, which are mapped. Uh, and it, it looks like any other space. But when you walk into that space, if you've got the, the right equipment, you can hear the sounds that are being piped in that space. It, be, it moves from being a, a passive space to an active space. It's a, it's a space that gives something back. Uh, and this is something which... Uh, uh, yeah. Coming back to that, we, we talk about the overlaps and the uh, and the what I call the coterminous uh, sort of overlaps, if you like. Yes. So, uh, I, so besides Baba's work, I, I find Grotowski very interesting in, in this regard. Has anyone heard of of, of yes, the, uh, Grotowski? Right. Okay. Uh, he was. He was. Uh, he is uh, a theatre specialist, po Polish. Uh, I think he died uh, earlier this uh, late last century. Um, but his work was in looking at poor theatre. He deals with the concept of poor theatre. That is, theatre divests of props and and all the all the paraphernalia that goes with theatre. To be, uh, and he boils it right down to theatre being about a space to be filled with the actor's body and a silence to be filled with the actor's voice. So he has a concern with the space itself. And one of the examples of, um, uh, of, of, Barbara's, uh, of Boas, of um, Jesse Grotowski's work uh, was, is the uh, a show called Was Albert. Um, now, Woza Albert was a, a show which put together by a South African marketplace theatre. Now, there was an interesting thing that happened between Jerzy Grotowski, who was working on theatre in Poland, influenced by Chekhov and all that kind of stuff, and what was going on in, in the South, uh, South African Township Theatre, because the link that they saw was this whole idea of poor theatre. With Jerzy Grotowski, it was clearly theatre with a capital P, 
that is theater divestive of the, the rich entrap, uh, trappings of theater, uh, but it's also about theater stripped down. It made an easy marriage with theater that, uh, that didn't have much to start with. What it had was an actor and a space. Uh, and so in, in this marriage, there's a kind of synchronicity that took place between uh, the sort of township theater of South Africa and the poor theater of, of Kotowski, and it's often used as an example of this, um, of, of this form of work. So what, what I'm looking at, I'll come to, 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 uh, to Wosa Albert in a minute, is the kind of link between the interior space and the interface, which Tim, for example, was talking about. The stuff happening in the interior space, but it affects the interface. And the interface itself affects what's going on in this interior space. And that is what uh, the relevance of Grotowski's work is. It's this interior space of the actor and his body and so on. And what happens in this interface between the actor, the audience, and the work, if you like. Though it might seem a bit contradictory to deal with an effectively essentialist notion of space, silence and the actor's body, when discussing the notion of the third space and context, what one is attempting to focus here and time and the impact of the, the interior space, as I was saying, on the external interface and vice versa. Now, this, this is, this is uh, an image from uh, a production of Woza Albert. Uh, you've seen one of the, of the most crowded scenes in there. This is the most props I've ever seen in this production. They have a box and they have some clothes and stuff in the background, which they kind of quickly put on. The original production didn't have all of that. Because what, what these actors do is actually they become a plane, a helicopter, they're in a factory and so on. And I, I saw this production in London, actually. Uh, and one of the interesting things to me is that when I left that theatre in London, I, all, the, all the images were in my head. It's like if I'd seen that, 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 that uh, helicopter, if I'd been in that factory and so on, because these actors have so carefully and so skillfully created those scenarios for me, including kind of getting on top of each other and, and the, the, the sort of helicopter thing going around and so on, and the sounds of the helicopter, etc. Uh, and that was uh, really just making use of that creative space to, to make changes. Uh, the, the performance by Wurzel Albert, for example, was taking place at a, at a market theatre in South Africa as uh, contextualised, transformed in the London West End. Uh, sorry, it's, it's, it's different when recontextualised and transformed in the London West End. So even though it's the same performance, it, it's slightly different because the people are sitting outside will read it a little differently because they know more or, or less about some of the references, some of the... the the, the things to which they appeal. And these are some of the parameters of a space, the thing that actually make a difference to the space in which we are. The change of location itself produced a change of the actualization of the play, the way in which it was portrayed, the way in which it was received and, and understood. One leaves the, the, the play with a sense of having seen a very elaborate set, though there's no set nor any real props as such for the actors to work with. Uh, threadbare comes to mind in the ways I described earlier. The, 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 the last person I'd like to refer to is the work of Auguste Boyle. I mean, this, this is actually breaking the ground in a number of ways because these works have not been actually contextualized, used in this kind of context. But the interesting thing about Boal's work, has anyone heard of Boal? Right. Well, I, I think he's quite significant in a way because he created something called Forum Theatre. Have you heard of Forum Theatre? Yeah. Uh, and there is a one well-known company that uses Forum Theatre in London, Cardboard Citizens. Actually, this is all the work they do. They work with homeless people. And they take on the issues of homeless people and they kind of use that as a, as a basis for the, for the drama, their theatre, using actors and non-actors, what, what uh, Boyle later called spectators, uh, to create plays to solve social issues. So Boal is concerned with uh, 
with what I call uh, uh, transformative theatre. His work, which was influenced by Paolo Freire, which many of you might have heard of, um, uh, uh, who's an educationist who talked about the, the pedagogy of the oppressed, he created something called the theatre of the oppressed. And within this big umbrella of the theatre of the oppressed, he's actually went through many, many stages and changes, now talking about legislative theatre and so on, and now he's based in Paris, etc. cetera. Uh, but forum theatre, I think, marks for me the pinnacle of, of, of his work and his thinking. And that is theatre which is about the actors, the spectators, uh, at, and the issues in a space. And in that space, things happen. Uh, that space is a program space. <laughs> it's an active space. Uh, and and uh, just a little uh, detour here, because he has a, a very interesting device which he uses in forum theatre. He has the, the act, of course, professional actors who know the play or a play. They have a narrative in their heads and so on. But that narrative can be changed by the, by the spectators, the, 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 the audience who can say, sorry, I don't like, no, that, that's how it went, that's how it goes. Can we change that? And they'll change it and it'll be down on the spot. <coughs> uh, the, another feature of, of, of forum theatre is the use of what uh, he called, when he was in Paris, I think, uh, but this is the name of the scene, it's like the joker. The joker is uh, a, a kind of uh, interventionist person who uh, remains neutral from the, from the drama, from the theatre, whatever, but can intervene and uh, add things or make observations and, and so on. In that way, they can help drive the, drive the process. The, the joker, in effect, is a part of the programming of the space, uh, making that passive space active. The theatre of the oppressed is largely based on the idea of dialogue and interaction between audience and performer. Moreover, these ideas have, have served as a, a, a framework for the development and evolution of stronger ideas. <coughs> so it is about, as I said earlier, actors and non-actors in a constructed space. Uh, one of the things that they have in common uh, and this is quite important to, to Boal's theatre, which is particularly uh, political. Um, besides the issues of, of time and space we talked about, is this overriding element of what I call he 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 hegemonic orthodoxy. That is, the whole power structure which affects the whole, uh, the whole setting, uh, wherever that, that might be. And that's quite important to his work. I, I wouldn't go into that because that takes us off onto another tangent. Uh, he sees some relational dynamics between oppressor and the oppressed and the immediate active space in which this happens. And this is all quite important to the drama. In this sense, forum theatre is dealing with both the actual and virtual, which merge into a single set of analyses, actions, and inventions. Uh, interventions. He talks about, uh, he, he feels that all theatre should be about change and political engagement. So when you do a piece of theatre, uh, and to him, political theatre is the only theatre. Uh, you, you actually take on the problem, you deal with it, you create a change, and in making that change within the context of the drama, you are actually making change in real life. So the image or symbol becomes a reality. He doesn't make a distinction between that symbol and the reality. But the, the, the key thing for him is space. So what we've looked at is... Um, the, the whole kind of dynamics of space. Uh, 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 and in terms of that space, it's about time, it's about place, it's about the space itself. Uh, and in this specificity of overlapping spaces, we have the interaction between audience and dramatic context, situational politics, the statement, whatever it is, the narrative, the, the text, etc., the signification, what is, what is the significance of this? Now, what I hope is that these sorts of ideas uh, will uh, continue to influence the way in which we think about and talk about uh, this situation which started very much within a, uh, a biomedical context, uh, which uh, I'll be looking for realizations and possibilities through music uh, and, and, and the whole the scale, there are certain kind of uh, connections there. But what I'm saying, there's also a wider context which needs to be taken into 
in, in consideration. I haven't got time to go into one, one of the ideas we've been talking about, about besides the digital sound of, of actually doing something with human beings in a space. Now, the minute you begin get human beings into space, making a sound or becoming a sound and interacting along the lines of what we've been talking about, we have interesting dynamics going on. Because uh, as pure as we want to make these people into pure sound, we will have real people <laughs> being pure, pure sound interacting in a space which we can chat to them. And interesting things will happen. I'm really excited about the, the, the research, and I hope that uh, we will produce a lot more interesting things for our, our own edification. And that will inform not only the, the kind of biomedical field, but uh, the whole field of, of arts and, and, and aesthetics. Thank you very much.